and welcome to Watch It Played. My name is Rodney Smith, and in this video we're going to learn the 2-5 player game, Honga, designed by Gunter Burkhardt and published by Haba, who helped sponsor this video. It's the Stone Age, and your clan needs a new leader. Can you fish? Hunt mammoth? Entertain a fickle saber-toothed tiger? Yes? Good! Then you might have a shot. So join me at the table, and let's learn how to play. To set up, place the game board in the center of the play area with this depot board nearby. These are the action discs, which will separate by their two colors, shuffling them into two face-down decks placed near the board. These are the barter cards, which you'll also shuffle, putting them face down here, and then you'll deal three of them into the spaces for them at the top of the board. The cards with this back are bonus cards, and these are shuffled and put face down here. Then you'll place the Mammoth Tooth in the Mammoth Field here, and Honga, the Saber-Toothed Tiger, in the central area. Each person now takes a tray in the color of their choosing, as shown here. For this video, we'll be setting up for two players, returning the rest to the box. You now collect the matching Caveman, Scoring Marker, Mammoths of your color, and take one of each food marker. The ones for fish, berries, and mushrooms you place in the one space of their related tracks, and water is placed on the zero space. Now place your caveman on the lowest step of the sacred mountain and put your scoring marker in the cave area here. Everyone now puts their mammoths on the depot board and the player with the shaggiest hair is then given the start player marker or you can just choose randomly. Then starting with the first player and going clockwise around the table, everyone draws a single gray action disc. And that's the setup. In Honga, players will be gathering resources, trading with neighboring tribes, hunting mammoths, worshiping nature deities, and just trying not to upset Honga, who just wants everyone's affection all of the time, forever. The player who can gain the most victory points by the end of the game will be crowned the leader of the clan. The game is played over a series of turns, starting with the first player and then going clockwise around and around the table, and on your turn, you'll perform four steps. First, you place your action disc face up onto any one of these four round spaces. And if another disc is already there from a previous turn, that's okay, just place yours on top. The key is that you need to make sure that the lines printed on your disc line up with those printed on the board. But otherwise, you can place it in any orientation that you like. This is important because the discs have a number of hands on the different sections, and later you'll take actions in the adjacent locations of the board that the hands are pointing to. For example, I've assigned one hand here, one to this area, and two here, but nothing here. And the more hands you assign to an area, the more you can do there. After you've placed your disc, it's time for step two called paying attention to Honga. Honga is the saber-toothed tiger that resides in the center of the board, and he just really, really wants your attention. So before you do anything else, check to see if you've assigned any hands on the disc you just placed to his central location. As long as the disc you played has at least one hand pointing here, then Honga is happy with you and he'll stay where he is, which is good, and then you can move on to step three. Now as we'll see later, Honga can leave this central area and visit other players, and if so, you still check to see if you have any hands pointing here. And again, as long as you do, Honga stays put, and you can move on to step three. However, if you did not assign any hands to Honga, like in this case, then no matter where he is, he gets jealous, and you have to take his piece from wherever that is, and then place it on your board and feed him immediately. You do this by spending one of the resources from the top row of your tray. So in this case, it would be fish, and when you spend an item from here, move its marker to the left. Once the marker is on the far left space, then you have no more of that resource. Now if Honga visits you when you have no fish, then he'll eat from the next row down that does have something. So he'd eat berries in this situation. If you have nothing at all, then he would eat a mammoth from your tray if you have one, which you'd then return to the depot. But if you have no resources or mammoths, then in that case, Honga doesn't take anything. Once you have Honga, he will stay with you until someone else doesn't pay attention to him. Now we haven't shown a full turn yet, but let's just say it's this player's turn now, and they assign their disc like this, ignoring Honga. Well, now Honga will travel to them and eat one of their food. But let's say instead, they actually did assign some hands here. If it comes back to your turn again, and everyone else did pay attention to Honga, then during your Honga step, even if you'd played a new disc where you did assign hands to the central area, Honga will stay with you and eat another of your food closest to the top of your tray. So really what that means is, once you've got Honga, there's no point in assigning hands to the center. You're just wasting them. 
He's not going anywhere until somebody else ignores him and makes him jealous. So you're better off assigning your hands to other areas you can take advantage of. After checking on Honga, whether he moved or not, you then go to step three, where you carry out actions based on the areas that you have hands pointing to. And you can complete the actions in any order. Just make sure you fully resolve one before you go to the next. So let's go through every action space on the board and see how each of these sections work. If you have any hands pointing here, then you're fishing in the lake and you gain one fish resource for every hand assigned to this area. So two in this case. Anytime you gain resources, you move your marker to the right and at most you can have 10. Any you gain past this point are simply ignored. Any hands you have pointing here let you draw water from the spring. And this is water that you gain by moving this marker to the right. This area here gains you mushrooms, and this one lets you look for berries. And again, for each hand assigned to these areas, you increase those matching values here on your board. This area of the board lets you pay homage to the old nature gods. And for each hand you have pointed into this region, you'll advance your figure one step up the sacred mountain. Now, to really show how this works, let's assume it's later in the game, and the figures are placed like this, and the red player had just used this disc. They would advance their figure three spaces. Now, as soon as you get to the top of the mountain, you stop. You ignore any extra hands you might have assigned, and then you score five points as shown here. Any other players on steps at this time gain the points showing on their related position, and then all the figures are moved back down to the lowest spot. Anytime you gain points in this game, you move the related markers here. So red would go to five and blue would go to one. Along with each hand that you assign here, if you also spend one berry, fish, and mushroom, you attract a mammoth by taking one of your color from the board and then placing it here in this first position, bumping any mammoths already here one step forward. So if I assigned two hands here and I spent two fish, two berries, and two mushrooms, then I could attract two mammoths. I'd place the first one here and then the second one would come in bumping this one forward. Keep in mind, you can choose to pay for fewer mammoths or even none at all. Just because you have hands assigned to a location, this or any other one, it doesn't mean you have to actually perform that action. Now, as more mammoths are assigned here as the game goes on, the herd will grow, and depending on the number of players, as shown by the dots on some of these spaces, then there'll be a certain maximum herd size. With two or three players, the maximum size is three. With four players, it's four, and with five players, it's five. If you add a mammoth to the track and the maximum number would be exceeded, then the one furthest along the track, the oldest one, it is removed and sent to the matching colored player's board. And we'll see how these collected mammoths can be used a little bit later. Either way, after a player has added their mammoths to the track, they check to see if they have the most mammoths in that area compared to each other player. If they have the most, as we see in this situation, they collect this tooth, either from here or from the player who currently has it, and we'll see the value of this a little bit later. If they only tie, the player who last placed the mammoth on the mammoth field gets the mammoth tooth. So in this case, it would go to the blue player. Pointing hands into this area allows you to barter with foreign clan villages. And for each hand here, it lets you fulfill any one of the face-up available cards by spending the goods in the bottom and immediately collecting the value shown here in points. So for example, to fulfill this, I need to spend two fish, and then I would gain three points by moving my marker. After a card is fulfilled, it is placed face up on the discard pile of this depot board, but do not replace any fulfilled cards at this time. That will happen a little bit later. Sometimes a cost will require a mammoth, and if so, you can spend one of your own from either the field here or from your player board if you have any in either location. And the one that you spend is then returned to the depot. The final action is searching the forest, and for each hand that you've assigned here, draw a bonus card. And after privately examining them, place them face down on the left side of your tray. Now you do this because you are not allowed to use these during the turn that you drew them. You'll instead gain them a little bit later, as we'll see. Now there are a variety of different bonus cards, and once you do have some in your hand, then during any turn, after you've performed the pay attention to Honga step, you can play up to two bonus cards while carrying out other actions. As you play a bonus card, put it face up beneath one of the slots shown here at the bottom of your board. This helps you keep track of how many you've used this turn, and then you resolve their effect. Now we won't go through how each one of these works, as they're all explained in the rule book, but I will point out this one, which is another way to get rid of Honga if you currently have him following you around and eating up your food. When this card is played, you return Honga back to the center space.
Also, I should mention that if you run out of bonus cards to draw, then reshuffle the bonus discard pile, which will be located here, to form a new deck, and then keep drawing any cards you are owed. Something else I should mention, that you're also reminded of here on the board, is that any time that you need to spend resources, maybe when you're trading with a foreign tribe, or when you're trying to add one of your mammoths to the board, you can always choose to spend two water as any one other resource, fish, mushrooms, or berries. And if you have lots of water, you can do this multiple times to replace multiple resource types. Either way, once you've taken your actions and used any bonus cards that you wish to, you'll move to the fourth step where your turn ends. Now clearly I've set things up a little differently than how they would look after a first turn because we have some cards missing up here, but I didn't even assign any hands to that area. I'm just doing this so I can show you all the possible things you might have to do at the end of a turn. For example, it's at this point that you now refill any empty spaces here with new cards from the deck. And if this deck is empty, just reshuffle the discard pile found here into a new one. Next, you'll discard any of your used bonus cards to this pile here, and then you can take any you just collected this turn into your hand. Now, you'll draw a new action disc to replace the one that you used. However, if you have the Mammoth Tooth, instead, you'll draw from this pile. These discs are always better because unlike the gray discs, which have a combination of four different hands, these will always have a combination of five. So each time you play one of these for your turn, you're getting to do a little more than everybody else. If either of these piles run out, then just find the appropriate discs on the board and reshuffle them into a new deck. But either way, your turn is now over, and then the next player in clockwise order takes their turn. And the game will continue like this with players taking turns until eventually a player reaches or exceeds a certain number of points, which will depend on the number of players. In a two-player game, this will be 40 points, and you're reminded of that by the dots that are on this space. Three players requires 35, and four or five player games require someone hitting 30 points. At that point, you'll keep playing until everyone has had the same number of turns. So just check to see who has the first player marker when this occurs, and that will tell you who still needs to take a turn, if anyone. After that, the player who has the most victory points wins. And if there's a tie, the tied player with the most remaining total resources wins. And if there's still a tie, the tied players share the victory. And that's how you play Honga. If you have any questions about anything you saw here, feel free to put them in the comments below, and I'll gladly answer them as soon as I get a chance. You'll also find forums for discussion, other videos, pictures, and lots more over at the games page on Board Game Geek, and I'll put a link to that in the description below. And if you found this video helpful, please consider giving it a like, subscribing, and clicking that little bell icon so you get notifications anytime we post a new video. But until the next episode, thanks for watching.